you have a vantage point. And you can, I would love for you to start and kick us off sharing how cities have been facing these unprecedented times we're living, how they're facing change, and how they are dealing with COVID-19 and also addressing other ongoing, uh, let's say, pressures coming from climate change and, of course, uh, the needs of growing population. So could you advise with us from your wisdom, what are those main challenges in recent years? And how are they how are they shifting? How are cities shifting to this brave new world? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, the challenges. Before I start with the challenges, let me give some a few uh, uh, data that maybe you already know that cities is the engine of growth. Cities is the hub of talent and skill. Cities also consume seventy percent of the energy and also emit 70% of carbon emission. And cities is also, and, and only consume in terms of land area is 2% of the land area. But at the same time, they have a lot of challenges. And um, I'm not to, to say whether it's uh, after pandemic, because we still have, a, 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 we have to live with the pandemic now. But I would like to, to share with you that the challenges faced by city, I would like to start with four C's to C's. 4C is the COVID-19, climate change, conflict and crisis, and capital. These are the four challenges. These challenges is not new, but it's just that COVID-19 exacerbate and wake up call for everybody in globally. They are already there in terms of, the, uh, of the challenges. And when you talk about COVID-19, the importance of basic services, I think for those countries who are from, even I, from, uh, I came from Malaysia or even from the north, you are maybe quite, quite surprised why there is no water in the global south. For example, in Africa, I went to Burkina Faso. I was so shocked when I went there, I saw a queue of women, queue to get water and children. And around two kilometers. And they are having yellow barrel on the head and I, I stopped and I asked when I went to, to Burkina Faso, I asked, why are you here? During COVID, I said, oh, because we want to take water to drink. And why are the children here? I said, oh, they are helping me. So meaning that the opportunity cost of the women lining up there and all the children, they're supposed to be at school or maybe homeschooling, but they are there, waited for hours to get a barrel of water and which is more expensive than the normal conventional water. So the basic services is very, very important. And I always quote this, don't ask them to wash their hand three times, four times a day if they don't even have water to drink. So this is important for us to look at. It's already there, the problem, but exacerbated by the COVID-19. That is on the impact of COVID-19 on provision of basic services. Second, the challenges is you ask them to stay at home, lockdown. If they have no home, how can they, 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 they lock down in the, in, 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 the, in the informal settlement? And then you say that, oh, you have a social distance. If they are crowded in the informal settlement, in the slum, how can you have a social distance? So I think this home is very, very important. The, the importance of uh, housing I think it's really, really a wake up call for not only for, for, for the, the, the developing countries, for the small island development state, but also for the, for the middle income countries, looking at the design, looking at the planning and design of the cities, I think during the COVID-19. COVID and, and another one is also, I'm talking about the, in Asia, the, the, the countries that I came from, Malaysia, they are having also problem of flooding, problem of uh, drought but not so much compared to Africa, but floods. So I think this is very, very important for us to look at the, and now what we should do next. Do nothing or do something. That is one on the COVID-19. On the climate, I think this is also important to, I always mention that we have to make our cities right in order to tackle the climate problem, climate emergency or climate uh, 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 justice, climate refugee. If you don't make the cities right, you don't plan, you don't manage the cities right, then to me, 
you can reduce the problem, you can mitigate the problem of of uh, of a climate change, but you cannot solve it. So I think this is and 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 and, and there will be a lot of funding will be there. Third is conflict. Either is it man-made conflict, man-made or uh, war, or natural disaster. I think this is uh, is very important at the moment now. You can you look it. Look around, even last time, Europe, Germany, and all that, there's no faulting, but recently I think it's flood. So I think it's a time now for us to do the rethinking. And the fourth is, of course, the capital. The city's revenue dropped. I think maybe Anna can, 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 can uh, confirm that it's dropped due to the lockdown, or, uh, 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 lock, uh, the, the down of economy. So where, and still, the, the, at the local government, they have to provide the facilities, they have to provide the services. So, capital funding is a problem, it's a challenge. And capital here is not only dollar sign, it's also the human resources. It's, it's very important when you have the human resources, you also have, must, must have the system, must have the governance. So, the challenges to me is that you have four challenges at the moment, COVID-19, climate change, conflict, and capital. I stop there. Thank you. No, thank you so much. I think she summarized our shared humanity's biggest issues, right? Right in the heart of cities. And your voice is so much desperately needed in your space. Thank you so much for bringing those voices forward. And I would like to go to Mayor Anna. What challenges have you seen from, from your perspective? And how are you facing the, the need to address this changing city landscape? Yeah, I think that Stockholm is not the only city that during the pandemic, it was a huge debate among citizens and in the media that is, this is the end of the cities and people were actually moving and we could see also a decline in, in the number of citizens and uh, it was a lot of, of debate of, of the future of the cities and uh, and that is something that is we see the effect of now. Um, many families have moved, but I still believe very strongly in the cities, especially through an environment uh, sustainable uh, perspective, because we know that density is also very good for um, to working with uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, and of course, what people ask for, um, especially during the pandemic, but what they ask for now as well is clean air, clean water, many green areas, much more than before. And we have remote working and it's still here, it changed the inner cities uh, of many cities among mine. Uh, so we have also to, to work with real estate agencies and city planners. How can we make the inner city, the core of the city more vibrant? Because 15 minute city that is good but i think also we need places where people from different areas of our city meet stockholm is a very segregated city mainly due to how we planned the cities in the 40s and we still live with the effect today they was try to separate you know the work from the civil servant um, and it's it's difficult once you segregated people in, in the city planning but what we find through data with mit is actually that high schools especially municipality high schools make people from different areas meet but also culture and different experience that are often in the center of the of the cities and they were closed so the cities hasn't been cities for a very long time and uh, we don't have tourists so a lot of restaurants were shut down as well but the restaurants in the suburbs were going really nice like, well because people were working remotely and had access to restaurants so i think one thing that we really think of now is how can we repurpose the office space to more home for families and affordable um, housing when we work now with electrification there will be less noise pollution so we can build in areas we haven't been building before that also could be possibilities for for affordable housing for example but also to integrate a mix of working places with with housing but i think that the strong message i would like to send is that we really need the cities we need to have a more livable cities that attracts talents and citizens and it's also I mean, we, we really need a growing cities in a sustainable way to, for the future. And otherwise, we will have a huge problem because we don't have the density. 
Excellent. Um, Data-driven decision-making also, being empathic for yeah. people wanting different kinds of services, right? I think we've we are so appreciative of, of when we have quality urban life. <laughs> it's so great that it's that you approached it in that way and in that finding spaces for people people to connect again, you know, neighborhoods and, and people. May Major Francis Suarez welcome again from your perspective from the city of Miami. You are also the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And uh, you also have also f fellow U.S. mayors collaborating. How have you faced similar challenges? What's your take in in what we are living today from the urban challenge? Well, I think cities across America are facing unprecedented challenges, and certainly uh, the pandemic has exacerbated those challenges. Uh, Miami is a bit of a counter narrative uh, because um, we are number one in the nation right now in pandemic recovery. Uh, that's a, a part of a part of that is based on how we've reacted to the pandemic. Um, we um, we were a big beneficiary, and you never want to be the beneficiary of a pandemic. Obviously, it's it's horrible, but we were a bit of a beneficiary because a um, the remote work phenomenon, which went um, and became a large part of, of of how we worked for a long period of time, uh, meant that a lot of the intellectual talent that we had been exporting for decades. Uh, in Miami came back. Uh, they came back and what they realized when they came back is uh, they started colliding with each other and, and realized that there was significantly more critical mass. I think uh, there were some other macro factors that in combination with uh, the pandemic led to a resurgence uh, and a sort of a technology uh, and finance a resurgence in our city. Uh, we attracted over the last 18 months about $2 trillion in assets under management companies to the city. Um, in, in just under two years, uh, our venture, uh, you know, our venture capital pipeline in, in just the last year increased, depending on, you know, what statistic you, you, you read or what, what, what metric you look at, anywhere from 200 to 400 percent year over year. So Miami, Miami experienced a boom. Um, not every city in America, unfortunately, has experienced that. There, there is cities are dealing with, um, unfortunately, high violent crime. Uh, high homelessness, and uh, and so we're we we as a city uh, which has seen reductions in homelessness, reductions in in violent crime, want to export some of the things that we've learned in Miami uh, to other urban cities in America, with the hope that we can scale our solutions nationally. Uh, you know, we we have a brand in Miami that we call Miami for Miami for everyone, uh, and our resiliency brand is called Miami Forever. So. Uh, we want to make sure that our country is also around forever and is also uh, serving everyone uh, in our city. So it's, it's, it's a challenging time, but we look at the dynamic challenge as an opportunity. Um, there, there are two ways to look at disruption. One of them is, is to sort of uh, um, be afraid of it and, and uh, you know, and, and, and try to pretend it's not happening. And, and that can be very, very destructive. Mm -hmm. The other way to look at it is, um, I call it a, a tsunami of opportunity, is to sort of surf that wave of, of opportunity. And we've done that. We've, uh, we've done everything we can to position ourselves in a way that will make our economy more resilient. We certainly focus on climate as well. And we understand that conflicts around the world affect everybody, right? Uh, people don't realize that the conflict in Ukraine uh, affects human supply chain issues for programmers, even in Miami, uh, that's growing its tech economy. So, you know, the world is very connected. And I think part of what leaders have to do is articulate that connection, create those uh, understanding points so that we can, uh, fa uh, you know, fashion policies and create a leadership opportunity for our uh, residents to understand how to take advantage of all this disruption. I love that word, the understanding points, <laughs> because it is really the connection, no? And the empathy to share the solutions for others to take advantage also from your own leadership. Thank you so much. So in cities, one of the most important assets is real estate in terms of, of presence of infrastructure and value of assets built. And of course, that has a big impact on our health and well-being and the future of the city. And Christian, I would like to bring you in. How has COVID-19, do you think, impacted real estate? And what does that mean uh, in terms of the climate crisis? Is that changing our cities? 
Well, I would say that COVID has probably accelerated some of the existing trends and in some cases probably accelerated by 10 years. We'll just pick a couple of asset classes. Now, retail, uh, the way people are shopping their goods has been a change for many years already and that has implications on how we use high street space, how we use shopping centers, but COVID has accelerated that massively and, and retailers have to reinvent the way they, they present their stores and that has an impact on, on real estate. We, we were not only talking about the, the end of the big cities, uh, we were also hearing a lot about the end of office space. <laughs> And again, it's just an acceleration of trends we saw before. A lot of companies uh, changed the way they laid out their office space. There was much more flex space, experience space. There was much more focus on the health and well-being within that space. We saw that very much in Asia going first because of the environmental situation there. People were focused that they have great air and, and great water in the buildings and those type of things. Again, that has been massively accelerated by COVID. And so COVID is just an accelerator, um, whereas the climate uh, crisis is the biggest disruption the real estate industry has seen probably for decades and, and will be. And, and that is something which will uh, need uh, a real strong concerted action. I mean, there are many statistics how much uh, of the carbon footprint is, is driven by the built environment. Uh, but uh, we can all agree it's a lot. Uh, we recently did a research that in, in the big global cities like London, Paris, Tokyo, it's, it's more than 70% of the carbon which is coming from the built environment. Yeah. And, and the challenge is now that we are only rebuilding a small piece of it. And it's very complicated to rebuild in big cities. So we have to think about the retrofit of existing buildings. And, and that is... That is uh, a particular challenge. It's very expensive and it has obviously then implications on the financial viability. And then that goes back to all the questions around affordable housing and, and, and so many, many topics where we have to find good partnerships between private and public. We have to find a good balance between stick and carrots. And we have to agree on how we measure and how we regulate. Because at the moment, there's a lot of uh, uh, drive for local regulation, but local regulation isn't scalable. Uh, so we need ag to agree on regulation so that it becomes scalable. Yes, we do need those conversations to you know, continue to tackle global challenges at a local level. And of course, buildings don't just exist on their own. We need the provision of great urban infrastructure. And Ian, how do you think the crisis from, from COVID, the health crisis, the climate crisis is changing infrastructure? And how do you see that is changing cities too? Yeah, I, te I tend to agree with Christian that I don't think the trends and the needs of change within cities is, has changed by COVID or, 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 the, or the pandemic. But I think it's accelerated the thinking and I think it's accelerated the profile of what needs to change with respect to climate and, and cities. And, and if we think about cities, I mean, many, many cities have evolved over centuries and they've evolved around trade and ports and, and water and, and basic provisions. And, and that evolution of cities has, has kind of brought them into sprawling masses of unplanned development without the right infrastructure, you know, without the right uh, water infrastructure, without the right transport infrastructure, without the right kind of today's infrastructure. So the needs of today and, and how we live and, 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 and how we, we, we work and, and how we, we, we move and transport ourselves are not really catered for in, in today's city. So we, we, we haven't got the opportunity to start from a, a blank piece of paper. And, and we have to think about how do we transform our cities to the needs of tomorrow. And, and I think we, we provide services across the globe. So we, we have a perspective and see the different rates of change within cities. And, and I, see, I, I see that most cities understand what's needed in terms of change, but have yet to find the, the, the route and the path to actually make those changes. Um, and if I pick up a couple, couple of the C's, um, so to speak, I mean, not particularly on climate change. 
I'm quite optimistic about the movement of transport to, to electricity, both from public transport and from personal transport and electric vehicles. And I think cities have generally got that in hand with providing infrastructure for that. I'm a bit less optimistic with the built environment. Um, and we have to remember everything that exists today, 80% of it is still going to be there in 2050 when we've committed to a net zero economy. So it's, it's actually changing what's already there. It's not thinking about building something different. So we've really got to get on with the process of, of changing what's, what's there. And I think, um, and, I, and I know for sure, in, in, in your city, um, Mesuarez, resilience uh, to climate change, resilience to um, uh, weather, and, and resilience to rising tides is a, is a key issue. And I, and I think that's a more short-term necessity that has to be dealt with because it's driven by reactive kind of investment. That is a worry for me because that will probably take away investment of other needs uh, as, as we need to be, uh, we need to be resilient. So, so those are kind of my thoughts on a couple of the C's. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I guess going in then into the looking into what's next from all these challenges and how can we with this, let's say, great diversity of voices and leadership that we have in this in this session, I would like to go to Christian and go back to to to, let's say, give more arguments to Ian to be more positive about the role of the built environment in tackling the issues going forward. What do you see are the different actions that different stakeholders maybe can take to deliver those, those cities that are livable, sustainable, resilient, and affordable real estate uh, and get those public collaborations, public-private collaborations going? Well, it is not an easy task, as he already pointed out. Um, uh, we have to focus very much on the uh, existing stock and uh, my first pledge would be to focus on technology tools. When you think about the HVAC systems, uh, we can, we can uh, use different software, we can use different motors and we have calculated that you can reduce the carbon footprint of those buildings easily by 25 to 30 percent. Uh, and that is something you can do relatively short term and the impact is, is much smaller obviously on the building than when you have to get into the structure or even demolish a building. So we need some very, very quick wins. Uh, secondly, uh, as I said earlier, we have to work with, with carrot and sticks. And, and so we have to offer uh, the owners of buildings uh, the carrot to invest into their buildings, to reduce the carbon footprint, to upgrade it, to move to renewable energy, on-site energy. There's tremendous possibility for creating on-site energy. But we also need that encouragement not only be, to be a carrot, we also need the stick. And, and, and kind of we, we have different examples around the world. Uh, some are, are more bureaucratic and others are less bureaucratic. But at the end of the day, you have to make it very clear that any new building which is being constructed has to be state of the art, has mm -hmm. to be green. And we also have to provide the encouragement that the existing stock has to be tackled relatively quickly. And, and you know there there there's not one silver bullet. Uh, it it has to do with with tax breaks. It has to do with direct subsidies. Uh, there are many many tools you can do to make progress. I am fairly optimistic that the push is coming from the large corporations around the globe mm. um, because they have all given themselves net zero targets. And in some cases, that's very, very hard to deliver. It's relatively easy to deliver on their built environment. And so they are requesting now spaces which are green. And the more they are requesting green spaces, the more of those green spaces will be delivered. And then that sets the example and that creates a lot of momentum. Momentum on the right business case for sustainable Absolutely. buildings mm. and, and, the, and the sticks that uh, he was referring to as a policy regulation that also encourages others to take action, right? Ian, uh, how do you see that moving forward? We were sharing as we were preparing that you are also leading by example and within your company, you're working on those partnerships to assist better, better decision make making 
for those collaborations to happen. Could you share how do you see that enabling better cities? Well, for sure, it's a collaborative effort. I mean, it's, um, it's a collaborative effort of all stakeholders. I mean, the needs of cities are, are many, uh, as, as we outlined earlier, or many outlined earlier. And I think to deliver on those, um, clearly companies like myself that provide the engineering and the design and the planning needs to work very, very closely uh, with the public sector, with the, the needs of the, the, the actual end users of the city, the public, um, to provide replanning, uh, reprovisioning, um, and the right infrastructure um, for tomorrow's world, really, and, and the right uh, places to live and the right amount of resilience, etc., for tomorrow's world. I, I, I do see that we're living with um, antiquated methods of procurement of uh, of, of how, to, how to deliver infrastructure or, or even how to deliver buildings by basically not thinking of outcomes. We're still thinking of it in terms of lowest cost wins the job. And, and that will not give us the best outcomes on a collaborative basis. So I think the way the, the public and private sector interact with each other um, is, a, is a high topic of conversation, certainly in the groups that I'm involved with. And, and there's some great examples of change um, across the globe, really, really collaborative great examples of change where, you know, multiple outcomes, where both social, net zero, um, economic, uh, are all um, married together to, to produce the right outcomes and the right solutions. So I am optimistic about that. That's good, it's good. No, we have a big challenge, so it's good to flag. <laughs> Maimuna, the majority of the world's cities will still be growing. In the, in, the, in the years to come in Asia and Africa and Latin America. Mm -hmm. What actions can take different actors of the value chain and stakeholders to enable those cities to leapfrog? Mm -hmm. Why not several mm -hmm. stages in development and mm -hmm. achieve and achieve more, mm -hmm. better outcomes, livability, affordability, resilience, uh, and, and you know, be low carbon too, why not? How do you see that going forward uh, from your role? Thank you so much for the questions. Yeah. To me, is that uh, what I mentioned earlier, the four C's in the C's, in the cities, is an opportunity, actually. So opportunity for us to do a rethinking. Uh, UN Habitat came out with a report, Cities and Pandemic. We, we have uh, 1,700 cities, and we, we came up with a report in, uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, and. Uh, we found out from that report, in order to live from, to answer your questions, that mm -hmm. we need four, four things. One, we have to think differently in terms of the urban design. I think many, many mayors, many cities, many governments have already done that. For example, turning public spaces, bicycle lane, uh, uh, pu public transport, for example, like like in 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 in, uh, in other, other areas from uh, uh, normal transport into the electric, but this face very big challenge in Asia in Africa. For example, in Africa, the matatu is, is you know is a is a uh, is a, uh, uh, um, a transport where as you will pack as many as possible. You don't talk about social distance or physical distance. So I think the need to rethink in terms of the design of the cities, the, in terms of the uh, housing that we are providing now, in terms of the mobility. I don't talk about transport, I talk about mobility because to transport people from one to another, there are many, many areas. And at the same time, also looking into the opportunities to do things differently. That's the first one. Second, from the, pub, from the publication, from our analysis, that the governance. We have to look at the existing governance to make to ease the give the environment the, the enabling environment for the green investment to come into the into the country or to come into the cities. That is the governance, which also include the system mm -hmm. and the people. Third is the new business model. I think this is what our colleagues mentioned earlier. That is the new business model. We cannot be using the same business model. The fourth quadrant is that we have to deal with poverty systemic poverty. Because if you don't deal with poverty, the root of the problem, we will only solve the symptom of the problem. I think it's not the root of the problem. Let me say, I just came back from Afri cities in Kisumu. 
and we discussed a lot of, of, of uh, uh, challenges and opportunities in African, African uh, uh, cities. Let's say a girl born today. If nothing happened, they will have a, or doing, we are doing nothing. They will, she or, or the boy will have a very bleak future. And, and, and you know that it's in terms of education, in terms of health facilities, in terms of housing. That's the reason why I had one conversation with a, a boy in the informal settlement. I said that education will change your life. He said that he didn't know that auntie, call me auntie, auntie, you are wrong. Oh, wow. I don't agree with you. I said, then what changed your life? is housing. I need a home. I need a house. When I have a house, then only I can study. If I have no house, I have homeless, how can I study? That's the reason why it take behind me I say that housing is very important for this. So I think that's one. I think there is a still hope because of, I bring this hope from this session and from every cities to COP27 because it will happen in Egypt, in Africa. And we continue the outcome of this di discussion into the, world urban, uh, into, into the COP27. And I hope also to bring into the World Urban Forum in Katowice. So to me, these four areas is very, very important for us to live from and to transform the cities into the cities that we want. So I think this is very important for us to give the opportunity for those people yes. who are born today, hopefully they'll be, become a, someone which I born in, 19, in the 60s in Malaysia and been given the opportunity by the government that is where I am here now. So I would like to give the same, same opportunity, equal opportunity for everybody in every continent so that they can have a better quality of life for all. Meaning all here is not only human, it's also fauna and flora. Sometimes we forget about the animal, we forget about the, the, the trees. So provide better quality of life for all in the urbanizing world. I stop there. Excellent put. <laughs> and, and it's so important to create opportunity and great cities create the basis, the, we, it sustains, it nurtures, right? And, and, and humans can thrive also with nature, not <laughs> not a, a no do away with it so i and there's so much opportunity even even for low income populations to through the protection of biodiversity through the protection of of not doing away with a sus the sustaining life forces right and good quality of life and bring all of the great principles we know from great uh, buildings to the most affordable, it's the same thing. It's the same principles. It's just the human journey we have to go. And if we are empathic and we share, a, the journey can be better for everyone. Thank you. I would like to go to Mayor Francis Suarez. If you could just share with us in that, in that journey, what, could, what actions would you share in this conversation that have enabled you to bring that sense of inclusion and prosperity and create cities that are more livable and equitable in this in this in this space yeah we we we, we name it uh miami for everyone and uh, jeremy mm. who's here with me uh came up with that name uh we, we have a brand called miami forever which is our resiliency yeah. and our climate resiliency brand but miami for everyone means that we want a city where everyone can be prosperous it's easy to say it's hard to do Mm -hmm. But uh, what we've done is we've focused on a variety of things that we think can empower people, uh, beginning with education. Um, we, uh, as a city, are not in charge of our education system, but we've partnered with other educational institutions to provide free education uh, for our citizens that can graduate with an associate's degree from the um, largest community college in the country, uh, either in a tech field or in a vocational field. We've done it through affordable housing. We've done, in my my time, uh, over um, you know over a hundred million dollars worth of affordable housing projects that are leveraged at somewhere between 15, 20, 25 to one rate. Meaning, for every dollar that the public sector puts in, the private sector and the private financial markets are putting in 15 to 20 to 25 dollars. That means we're getting a couple of billion dollars worth of affordable housing. We've uh, taken out food deserts in some of our impoverished neighborhoods, um, and I think 
the cycle of all that, we created a poverty initiative, uh, which was sort of like an incubator where um, if someone has a great idea of how to reduce poverty, we fund it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, we're number one in the nation right now in wage growth. So we've created high paying jobs um, and helped uh, through uh, job fairs, people get connected to those high paying jobs, understanding that um, we want to be a conduit to that prosperity. So we've looked at it very holistically. And what happens is when you have that sort of holistic perspective, then uh, you achieve uh, low unemployment, which we have. We're at 1.4% unemployment, according to Bloomberg, which I didn't even think was possible. Um, and, and that influences other factors. That influences your homicide rate. You know, we were down 23% in homicides last year. This year, we're down uh, close to 40% in homicides. Uh, we have the lowest homeless rate since 2013. So if people are employed, if they're creating prosperity for themselves and their family, um, it helps with other societal issues that plague cities. So we've taken a very holistic approach. Uh, we understand that government can't solve every problem. We try to be humble about that. Uh, but we do think that there is a, a, a room for leadership, right? And there is an opportunity for leadership where you can convene and get all of the different stakeholders in a city together to be creative and come up with solutions that are going to help people. Excellent. Thank you. And so it's that enabling role of the city leader. Yes. And Major Anna, in that space, what has been your enabling role into, into improving the conditions of life? Uh, no, making cities more livable and prosperous for, for your constituents. Yes, I, I totally agree with, with the role of education and also mm-hmm. to, to send a me- message that no matter where in the city you live, you're still a member of the city, you're equal, and, and that's a very strong message because these times um, forces try to polarize people and say us and them, so it's, it's crucial for us to be strong leaders with that message. But, but one thing is that I think for a city's perspective, we need to be better, uh, procu- we have to do better procurements and, and be more aware of the innovations that also is within the business community and with the, the academia. And we have to be involved. So if we have living labs or test beds, the cities also need to be active there. Or we ask for solutions. We talked about that earlier today when ask for a bridge and a solution of that, not a specific amount of, of concrete, for example. Then you will get the concrete, not the best sustainable solution that it perhaps is less concrete than you used to have before. Or sensors that could sh- show that the bridge could live for 20 more years uh, it's in spite of, of the plan you set up in the city. So just to have this data to work with the business community, we have different pacts in our cities as we work with companies uh, to create more sustainable solutions and that creates jobs and inclusiveness. And some of the solutions we also export. Uh, and I would say that our city is the city in Europe that have the most investment now for sustainable solutions with impact. So we see a lot of capital coming in also from the US to uh, impact investment, uh, financing the race to net zero. And one good example is that often we talk about the global south or the Nordic perspective and so on, but, but actually we can see that we have hubs in Stockholm for sustainable entrepreneurs and sustainable solutions within the industry. And now they are starting in Kigali, they're looking at Nigeria that will have more inhabitants in the end of this century than China. So it's crucial for us to scale uh, really fast the solutions, but it's also business, but it's also, I mean, creating jobs both in Africa mm-hmm. and in the Nordic. So that's another example how we, you know, the, the world is getting more global and connected and it's actually also possibilities. And of course, we have a real threat. And we take it very seriously, but, but also see the possibilities that we can work together in different continents. Excellent. I love that sense of solidarity and that innovation. We have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. So if you would like to make a question, please just raise your hand. And for the camera, if you could stand up when you're speaking. Yes, please. And please let us know your name and what you do. So I am Ramesh from uh, India, Mumbai, and work for a company called Mahindra, which is into various businesses. And I'm hearing more, we are still talking of uh, the same cities becoming better than before, which means uh, the density population in the same city will continue to remain. 
uh, and my guess is uh, all governments should work towards developing more cities in each country and create opportunities in more cities like health, education, uh, business opportunities, employment opportunities. So I was looking for your comments. Uh, should we not really look at more cities? I mean, if you look at 10 years back, 20 years back, the same cities continue to remain and we see population coming and crowding in the same cities. And then we are talking of opportunity shrinking, living conditions not improving. So I wanted your comment, should we not look at developing more cities in each country? Okay, so maybe, a, who would like to take that question? Maybe Maimuna, you're an urban planner. Do you think we should have more, more, more cities? Thank you so much uh, for that question. So, yes, uh, I'm a urban planner by profession. And I was a mayor before for seven years in the city of Penang. <laughs> Georgetown, and now it's Ethiopia and I think that's why you asked me to, uh, to yes. answer this question. <laughs> yes. I think I will say that it's both. Yeah? The old city and also the new city. Yeah. Because city expand. But we must have the limit. That's where I always put forward well-planned, well-managed cities. We cannot be, we can't afford to have an urban sprawl and an unplanned urban sprawl. I think this is very, very dangerous because it's, uh, that's why in, in, in recently, I just want to, I just came back from every cities. I just want to share mm. with you the, the thought that it's got the, the role of intermediary city or some people call it secondary cities. Because if we don't plan it well, it will become another capital. So we would like to have the, 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 the symbiosis between the metropolitan those people coming in because why people move from secondary cities to big city or from the rural to urban areas because they want to find they hope to get employment they hope to get an education they hope to get a, to get a, a, a recreation but sometimes they frustrated and land up at the slum or informal settlement so I think we need to better look into the plan the intermediary cities before we Think of for creating a totally new cities. If the needs to create a totally new cities, please come out with the criteria of the green city. Not don't repeat the mistake in water exactly. comma that we fit. Come out with the criteria first before we even think want to develop a new city. Otherwise, you will create you just transfer the problem from the from the metropolitan to the new city. And it will, you will, you will, you know, uh, you will uh, recur. So I think this is very, very important. I always say that the opportunity is to rethink, to rethink. But sometimes there is a need for for new cities, but 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 don't do it just for the purpose of. There are cases that oh, the cities is I cannot manage the city. Let, let's do a, a a new city. You know, hoping that you become better. I don't think so. So we have to really, do we have to really think of the criteria. The need is there, but think of the criteria. Excellent. Thank you. I Thank think you. an interesting example uh, mm -hmm. of a innovative planning of a city mm -hmm. is Neom City. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've seen that. It's a 170 kilometer linear city mm -hmm. where everybody lives in hubs along the mm -hmm. linear mm -hmm. city. There's a transport link, mm -hmm. one end to one end. Everybody can walk to the na mm -hmm. natural environment from the, mm -hmm. the city. It's completely radical. Uh, kind of idea. It's called Neom. There's a lot of information on the web. Excellent. Very interesting. So we're going to wrap up in one minute. That's the challenge we have. So I would like to go and if you could share one word of your takeaway from this session, you can have even four words, but in four one, inspir you, you're the expert in, the, in, the in, in, in summarizing. Okay. To me, uh, in UN Habitat, we, um, we have discussed very lengthy what, what is important now is that after this, uh, well, during this pandemic or after this pandemic, we have to look into housing. Yes. Climate change and climate adaptation. Yes. And last, localization of the SDG. Yes. We don't really talk, but we have to act now. Thank you. Thank you. Local solutions. Major Anna. I think to, to attract talents and to make livable cities, we need more green space. They are used now to work remotely in, in parks or in, in gardens, and we bring them home, more green areas. That builds also resilience. So it's investments 
both in nature and climate-based solutions, but also in our cities for the future. So I think it's, uh, it goes together if we use this opportunity well. Excellent. And it talks to what we want. Major Spartis. Yeah, I think Ian sort of referred, I think it was Ian that mentioned this, you know, the world is becoming more experiential. And uh, I think cities need to reflect that reality. Um, and I think the, 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 the key to a city, whether it's a new city or an old city, is quality of life, mm -hmm. right? What are you doing to make sure that the quality of life of your residents is a premium since what they're gonna care most about is the experience of living in the city. So in, in America, 85% of the population of America is in American cities. 91% of the GDP produced in America comes from American cities. So there's a case for the American city, but I think for the American city to thrive into the future, uh, parks, uh, sporting events, uh, how they shop, um, you know, obviously climatic, uh, you know, impacts and of course economic opportunities all uh, need to revolve around sort of that quality of life rubric safety as well. Thank you so much. Christian? A lot of companies and, and people in general are still waiting uh, until others have to move as well. Mm -hmm. And my plea would be that the ones who can go first and set the example because time is running out here. Thank you. So lead now. Ian. Uh, three words, partnerships, yes. planning, and reprovisioning what we already have. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. It was so inspiring. I hope you enjoyed it. And I guess we'll see you at the next sessions on cities in the next few days. Thank you to the World Economic Forum for its leadership.